right? So maybe there's a bug in some sort of a file server that we use to store the grades file. And that's going to undermine our whole carefully laid out plan of setting permissions and, you know, threat models and so on. If there's bugs, things are not going to work out so well. Other thoughts. If you're tasked with reading a grades file and you weren't a TA, what could you do? What should we worry about? Yeah? What if I logged in as a TA using a password? Yeah, like log in and I guess, like guess the password. Yeah, that would be damaging, so we better have some plan to handle that. Good that you're thinking, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 just, yeah, grab the, yeah. <laughs> grab the laptop after login. Then you don't even need to know the password. They already logged in for you. Very convenient. Other thoughts? Yeah? Would you have it over the internet? Yeah, like you can monitor Wi-Fi. So maybe if the TAs are accessing the grades file from their laptops here, you'll just monitor the grades file as it's nicely flowing to them. Better be encrypted on the wire or something, or in, in wireless transmissions. Other thoughts? Yeah, there's like a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you could like go to you know some machine room in uh, you know W92 or maybe wherever it happens to be located, maybe in Boston these days. It's like yeah, log go in. There's a server. You could pull out the disk or and uh, just like read it. It's, uh, it's there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so you could uh, lots of attacks. Uh, you could get a job at the registrar's office and just read the grades that way. <laughs> it was just like no end in sight as to uh, what you could try to do here, and it sort of makes it important that you really figure out how far are you willing to go, like. How important is it for you to defend against all these issues and uh, what kinds of measures you want to take? So this negative goal is particularly difficult to deal with and what actually ends up happening is that you usually can't get the stuff right the first time around. Like we're listing off some examples but I'm sure someone determined as an attacker will look at the list of examples we cooked up and say, well, I'm cleverer than that. I'll find an n plus first item in that list and break in that way. So inevitably, the way to sort of build secure systems is you have to iterate. And you have to uh, iterate sort of both in the broad sense, like you really have to learn from examples of you know, past attacks and analyses of post-mortems uh, of what went wrong. So various uh, compromises uh, have happened in the past, many of them, and there's lots to learn from to understand what went wrong in practice and what did previous system designers forget about in the threat model or did they get the policy wrong or bugs in the code, who knows. And it's also important to iterate the specific system you're building. So probably you gotta evolve your policy or the threat model and all these other components as you're moving along and learning about, in your case, what are the attacks that matter, what are you forgetting about, etc. But an important lesson is that despite all this iteration, you'll never have a 100% sort of bulletproof negative goal because, as you can imagine, there's always some attacker that will do something that will undermine your security. Like they, they could threaten you. They could steal the server, as we were talking about. They could like, pick up a discarded printout from the garbage and get the grades filed that way. You really have to figure out where to draw the line. And even though security, as a result, is not going to be perfect, um, it's still a valuable thing. So one lesson maybe to draw from all the security stuff is good grief, everything is bad. I should just give up and like not work on security. Uh, it's like a, a possible realization you could come to. And uh, but it might, might, despite, it might still be interesting to worry about security because at the end of the day, you really want to worry about the cost of attacks. And uh, at some level, you want to make sure that it's just not worth it for the bad guy to try to break into your system and uh, violate your goal. Some of these costs are real, like breaking into a data center and stealing a server probably requires you to, you know, find some tools and bribe a guard, et cetera. Um, at another level, it might be just, uh, you know, design level. You've got to think a lot how to break into a system. Another reason why security might not be super depressing is, uh, <laughs> well, that's a depressing way to state it, uh, but uh, there's a lot of techniques there that have a huge payoff. So even though you can't be perfect, a lot of the things we'll talk about in this class are really ideas that have a huge impact in improving the security without having to, for the defender to put up a whole lot of cost for it. 
So big ideas that really shift the balance much more to the guy defending their system as opposed to the guy trying to break in. Those are the really positive things and really powerful ideas for how to build a good system. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's probably gonna be important for you to figure out how to recover from attacks. Even though they're gonna be inevitable and will happen, you should, probably, you should have as part of your plan something that you're gonna do if uh, the bad guy does get in. So maybe the grades file get compromised. Well, it would be even worse if they got to change the grades file. So maybe we should worry much more about what if they erase the grades and then we can't assign any of you any letter of grade for it all for a semester. That would be even worse. So maybe we should have recovered from that at least. And uh, sort of, I guess, the, the reason why these things sort of show up so much in computer security is that um, in computer security, a lot of these attacks are super cheap. And the internet makes it easy to connect to lots of computers around the world, and there isn't a whole lot of cost to breaking in. The same analysis that we've talked about sort of applies to real world security as well. So maybe someone could break into my house, and it's a negative goal how to keep bad people out of my house. They could go in the window, in the door, in the basement, et cetera. But part of the reason I don't worry about it as much is because the attacks are more expensive, and there's a sort of a sense of deterrence in the real world where we can figure out who it is and punish them. This doesn't work as well in computer security because attacks are cheap, because it's easy to get computers to try lots of things and break in on behalf of a bad guy, and because deterrence doesn't really work because there isn't really a strong sense of a identity on an internet where anyone can send packets. So that's sort of the lay of the land why computer security is difficult and what to do about it at a super high level. Make sense? Sort of questions. Probably hard to have a question about something so vague. Uh, but the plan for the rest of this lecture is to look at examples to sort of start you on this line of iterating on various attacks so that you start thinking like the attacker. What could go wrong and what do you have to get right in a computer system? We'll sort of look at lots of examples of systems where various pieces have failed and uh, how you might avoid it. And as you can imagine, all three of these components, sort of both the policy, the threat model, and the mechanism have and do go wrong in practice. And we'll try to organize our examples along those lines. Any questions before we dive into various examples? Yeah. Which one follows what? In what order? Well, uh, at some level, there is no order because the whole thing matters and you'll probably evolve them over time anyway. Uh, you know, I wrote them in this order, but <laughs> I don't think there is any sort of sense, you know, big order to these things that matter. Uh, you gotta get all them right and they're all interrelated to each other. Uh, I should really say, like, don't, don't take this super serious. If you really try to dig down and do a reductionist analysis, like, what is the policy, what's the threat model, you'll quickly realize this is a little bit silly. Uh, and like, in reality, this is, doesn't quite line up perfectly. But it's a good high level way to look at the world. And uh, you should be able to sort of figure out, well, you know, yeah, in reality it doesn't line up, but at least I sort of understand what the plan should be. Does it make some sense? All right, so let's look at examples of policies that have gone wrong. Um, so here's a very simple example, almost not entirely computer system related, but uh, I was talking to some person who was running the computer support for an airline, and they discovered a surprising issue with business class airfare. So the policy there was that this airline would sell business class tickets, and if you bought one of these expensive business class tickets, one of the things you got is the ability to cancel it or reschedule a ticket. So it seems so far so good, like maybe this is a money losing plan or not, depending on how expensive this is, et cetera, but at a high level it makes sense. You buy this ticket, you can change it for a later date if you want, and, and so on. It turns out, this turns out to be like not a good policy for the following reason, which is that the computer system behind all this allowed changing the ticket at any point, even after the guy boarded the plane. So what they discovered is they had some customers that would buy business class tickets, got on the plane, and then used their phone to change the ticket for a later date. At that point, they just flew, but they now had a ticket to fly again. So this is a sort of an infinitely renewable ticket. That was a, you know, a bit of a bug, if you will, in the policy 
uh, separate from the question of whether it's a good idea to sort of sell it at all. So the fix to that was presumably that after you boarded the plane at the sort of gate to the airplane, you were not allowed to change the ticket anymore. And you can imagine that actually this is like, well, at some level, you gotta realize this in the policy and specify it, but there's maybe some real world consequences. Like you had that new policy now, you need some new mechanism. Like you need the gate check-in machinery to talk to this database and update the booking database to say, well, this guy is now checked in, you should prevent him from changing the ticket again. So changing a policy might have all kinds of repercussions down the stack, like you have to install computers everywhere that will talk back to the, uh, if you didn't have them before, that will talk back to your database and prevent uh, the ticket from being rebooked. That's a sort of a simplistic example. Um, here's another sort of nice example uh, from the world of school systems. Um, so this is an example from a school system. I think this was a high school in Fairfax County in Virginia in the US. Um, so the, some kind of a standard you know, system where students would store assignments and uh, their reports and homeworks, et cetera. Uh, the interesting parts with respect to this policy issue was that the school system had uh, users. There are three types of users. Every user could either be a student, so nothing too surprising there. They had some files they could upload, homeworks, et cetera, assignments. Um, you could also have the director of the school. This guy was the superintendent. Uh, he could read all files. So just in case, they had the super user effectively in the system that had full access. And then they also had teachers that could you know, give assignments to students, uh, take, receive their assignment files, et cetera. But for the purposes of this sort of interesting policy issue, uh, what happened was that uh, teachers were allowed to basically sign ad drop forms. So if you are a student, you came to class, and you said to the teacher, well, you know, I'd like to take your class, the teacher could basically sign off on it and add you directly in the computer system as a student. So teachers can add students to their class. And the other interesting issue was that the computer system um, had to worry, you know, students uh, maybe are not sometimes the most diligent in high school at least about remembering their passwords. The teachers would often get requests from students to reset their passwords. So the computer system was changed so that a teacher can change the password of the students in their class. So here's an interesting question. In this system, suppose that you're a student, you find one of the teachers is particularly lax about their security. Like, you know, in some class, the teacher just leaves their computer on the desk at all times, and you can just walk up and use it. How bad is that? What's the damage? So easy cases, like, you can probably, you know, change the passwords of all your students in that same class, maybe look at the assignments. Is it worse? Yeah? Change anyone's password because you can add them to the class. Yeah. So you can add a particular student to a class and maybe change them, their passwords. Yeah, so that seems pretty bad. Yeah? Could you add the director as a student to change the password? Exactly, yeah. So this turned out to be a real bug. You know, you know, doesn't have to be, but indeed, in this case, they, it was like broken in this particular way. I could walk up to a teacher's computer and I could say, well, no, the director, he's a user in the system. I'll add them as if they're attending the class. Then this says I can change the director's password. And then I can have access to the whole system. Uh, I don't have to enumerate all users, and it's actually even worse than all files. Now this guy has access to grades, et cetera. Um, so that was a particularly unfortunate choice of a policy. Um, so you could imagine lots of fixes. You could imagine saying, well, it's only the students. You can't just ar add arbitrary people uh, to your class. It better be a student and not the director and not other teachers. Um, you could imagine saying, well, maybe this is a bad plan. Maybe you've got to go to some you know, IT office in the school to change your password. Um, the fix is not super important as long as you realize the problem. There's many ways you could fix it, and then probably the fix depends on the particular details of the system you're worried about. But that's really hard to get this stuff right. And like, not that this is a hard fix, but just realizing this, thinking about this ahead of time is tricky. And here it's like nicely all written out on the board with the relevant facts here. But this was a system which was kind of complicated and partly implemented, and then at one point they added this feature to it. Well, no one went back and thought about all these issues until someone cleverly realized this was a possible attack. Make sense? Questions? All right. Um, so here's another interesting issue. 
sort of related to this password reset scheme, um, which turns out to be a common theme in policy problems, uh, is uh, worrying about account recovery. <clears throat> so a well-known example, at least from uh, you know, maybe about 10 years ago, was um, there was this vice presidential can candidate, uh, Sarah Palin, who was running with, uh, I think, uh, John McCain at the time for president. Uh, would have been, I don't know, a decade ago or so now. Um, she had a Yahoo email account. And uh, Yahoo at the time uh, you know, had passwords like everyone does now. But if you forget your password, you can ask it to reset your password for you. Well, what then? How do you reset the password? You, don't, you can't ask for the password because that's the only thing you're sort of using to identify this person. So a common scheme that's still widely used is to use some kind of a recovery question. So I forgot my password, let me click the reset link. It'll ask me, well, what high school did you go to? You know, what year did you, I don't know, meet someone? What's your favorite pet, et cetera? In the case of Sarah Palin, she had some recovery questions like what high school, whatever, when did you get your first job? These were all documented in her Wikipedia page. She was well known. So someone realized that indeed, if I want to access Sarah Palin's account, I can click on this reset link and use the Wikipedia page to look up the answers to every one of these recovery questions and log in. So the, if you will, the, the, the intended policy sort of was, well, you should really supply your password if you know it, but only if the user forgot the passwords, then you can fall back to these questions. But of course, you can't implement that policy. What actually ends up happening is it's sort of the, the weaker of these two things. It's either the password or these questions at any time. So you better be sure that your recovery questions are at least as strong as your password. Otherwise, there's no point in having a better password. This particular guy went to jail. Uh, so sometimes deterrence works. Um, but uh, probably better to, good to design a better system anyway. Um, so that was a particularly easy example, uh, hopefully one that you realize uh, by now as well. Um, here's a more sophisticated attack that happened a little bit more recently. This was uh, actually an attack against a, a journalist at a magazine called Wired. Uh, someone was trying to break into their Gmail account. Google is pretty sophisticated though, so if you try to, if you have a Gmail account and someone you know, connects to it and says, well, I'd like to reset the password for this account, Google isn't just gonna ask you some questions. In this particular case of a user, they had a backup email address that was used to send a confirmation link to say whether you're actually approved resetting your Gmail password. So this guy, Matt Honan, had a Gmail account. His backup email address was actually hosted on Apple's me.com cloud system. And uh, this bad guy tried to break into their Gmail account, into Matt's Gmail account. Gmail send a recovery, you know, check or, you know, confirmation to the victim's Apple account. All right, so far, not any stronger. Suppose you want to reset your Apple account. What happens? Well, in this particular case, uh, it turns out you can call Apple on the phone and say, well, I'd like to reset my account. I forgot the password. I have no backup email. This is the only iPhone I have. There's no other email address. Well, they can, they, at least in this case, they didn't have a recovery sort of alternative email address. They said, oh, you can give us your mailing address and the last four digits of your credit card number. Well, the address was sort of easy enough for this guy. He was a journalist. His address was somewhat publicly known. How do you get his credit card number? Well, okay, so far, not any closer, really. Uh, but it turns out this guy also had an account at Amazon. And uh, Amazon um, stores your credit card numbers. So, you know, for this guy, Matt Honan, uh, he, they had their credit card number, the whole thing, because they got to charge it if he purchases something. But how do you get it? Well, you got to log into the Amazon account somehow. Okay, you call these guys up on the phone and say, ah, I have an Amazon account. I want to reset the password. They say, well, you got to give us the whole uh, credit card number, the full credit card number, if you want to reset the password. So it seems only worse than the Apple guy. Like here, at least you need the four digits. Amazon says to reset the password, you need the full credit card number. But here's where sort of this chain started to unravel, which is that Amazon uh, lets you buy stuff, okay, not too surprising, and they have this kind of a clever thing, which is that if you are buying something, 
If you want to use a saved credit card number, you need to log in. Makes sense. If you want to buy something and supply a new credit card number right there, you don't need to log in. They want to make it easy to buy stuff. So I can say, well, buy something. And by the way, here's a new credit card number. And by the way, yeah, sure, save it for me. So the attacker bought something on this guy's account, doesn't matter what, using the attacker's credit card number and saved it. Aha, so now the attacker's new credit card number goes into Matt's account. Now you could call up Amazon on the phone and say, I'd like to reset the password for Matt's account. And by the way, here's the credit card number I just saved in there. The full thing, I know the whole thing, I just put it there. They happily reset this guy's Amazon account. Then, it turns out, if you log into Amazon, you can actually ask it to list the saved credit cards. And it doesn't show the whole thing, but it does show the last four digits of all the saved credit cards you have at Amazon. So what happened now, as you can probably imagine, the bad guy used this trick to get access to the victim's Amazon account, then listed the saved credit card number, got the last four digits of the real credit card number, not the fake one he added, then called up Apple, reset the guy's Apple account, then got this recovery email, reset the guy's Gmail account as well, and then changed that password, the guy couldn't get to any of his accounts. So, complicated, yeah? Uh, ah, so this is the thing that I uh, perhaps didn't explain as clearly. Uh, Amazon wanted to make it really easy for you to buy something, so if you weren't logged in, but you didn't use a saved credit card number, they said, that's fine. You're not using the saved credit card number, we'll just let you buy something because you're providing a new credit card number here anyway. That's right, yeah, so if, 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 uh, if you're trying to buy something, well, this no longer works, but back then, any of you guys could try to buy something from Amazon using my Amazon account. You couldn't use my saved number, that would be just horribly bad, but you could supply your own number, and then Amazon said, well, what does it matter? He's buying a book, he's shipping it wherever he wants, he's supplying the credit card number right here, that's fine, we don't need him to log in. There are no information seems to be leaking. But it's really putting in the new credit card number into here, that's where it went wrong, and combined with this policy, and that you could extract more stuff once you were logged in, this is a, yeah. So you could argue maybe this is the worst offender in this picture, the fact that you could like, anyone can inject a credit card number into anyone else's account. Uh, but the whole thing is sort of, you know, relying on all kinds of tenuous assumptions. As an example where like maybe the threat model of, or this, this whole plan for each individual system seemed sensible enough, but when you put all of them together, they interact in surprising ways and presumably, you know, each of them made seemingly sensible assumptions, but uh, the, the, the sum of the parts fell apart. Uh, yeah. Any questions about this uh, example? All right. So one thing that this really illustrates is that often where policies go wrong is sort of at the periphery. The common case usually works well because you can see it, it's easy to reason about, but it's all the extra stuff where policy issues are thorny and error prone. So as we saw, like it's really changing passwords often ends up being a big source of problems and policies. Figuring out who has access to backups, who can look at the system logs, who can update the software. These are all sort of peripheral questions that often don't have clean answers that are just obviously secure, and you really worry about whether you got those answers right. Well, in these examples, they didn't. Uh, Make sense? So all these periphery cases matter a lot. All right, so here's uh, maybe the sort of last thing I wanna say about these uh, examples of policy problems, and that is insecure defaults. So a really big source of security problems in deployed systems are various default settings that end up being a bad setting or an insecure setting. So for example, uh, known default passwords. So lots of uh, devices like home routers or cameras or other embedded devices that you might have at home sometimes have default passwords that are just known to everyone because they're published in a well-known PDF manual by the manufacturer. And this ends up being a bad plan because if a bad guy can access your device, they can Guess this password, and unless you are super diligent in changing every default password, the bad guy couldn't get into some device, and maybe it'll be part of a bigger plan that'll be much more disastrous than this guy gaining access to some thermostat you have at home. 
Um, another example is uh, sort of public default permissions. So uh, Amazon has this uh, cloud service, AWS. They have this file storage service as part of it, S3, for a long time. And to some extent still, the default permissions in Amazon's S3 service were that if you upload an object to a bucket, it got public permissions. So unless you were careful and thought about this ahead of time, you could easily upload all kinds of sensitive stuff to Amazon S3, and then someone will discover it. And this has happened numerous times to lots of companies where, turns out, their internal data was uploaded to S3, and they never really thought about, ah, we should have reset those permissions. So the issue of default, of course, is an important one in lots of cases. Like, you'd like to use a system that has sensible defaults in all kinds of contexts. But the reason this is particularly damaging in the context of security really has to do with the fact this, that we have this negative goal. And what I mean by this is that you're going to be building a large system. It's going to be com cons consist of lots of components. You'll have you know, some cloud service like Amazon S3 where permissions matter. And you'll use some home router or home thermostat where passwords matter. And unless you're extremely careful, you'll forget one of these components, oversight. So, and if you forget one of them and the default is not secure, you're in for some trouble. So this is why defaults matter so much in the context of security compared to somewhere else. Uh, it's easy to overlook something, and if you've overlooked it, you'll get the default. So it better be the case that the default is pretty good that you can hope your system is secure even though you've overlooked some default setting. Make sense? So these defaults are hugely important if you're building up a larger system. Any questions? Yeah? It seems that some of these defaults might actually arguably make more sense from a business standpoint so that your user doesn't have to declare defaults for themselves. You're right. Some of these things make more sense from a business perspective. This is not a class about business. This is a class about security. Uh, and OK, so this is like somewhat less facetiously. I think there's, of course, tension. Like Some of these are maybe easier to use. Maybe these are, require less cost from the manufacturer. Like, Someone makes a home router. If they randomize that password, now, first of all, they got to print out a random password sticker and stick it on the, each router. Otherwise, how do you know it? Someone is going to lose that sticker, and you'll get a support call. You got to pay some support person to walk them through resetting their password. It's like a cost. Why bother? Just like make it known the password is X everywhere. Then you have no question. Now you have a security problem, but at least no business problem. Uh, so I think there's definitely attention in between security and many other things, often usability, sometimes performance, business. Um, one way to think of it is security's job is to say no. So the only possible consequence is someone's not getting their work done. <laughs> so you have to be prepared that security is going to sometimes prevent you from doing what you want, and then you got to figure out how to make it happen regardless, like log in correctly, install the certificate, et cetera. Uh, but it is a, indeed a, a real tension in practice. All right, other questions? OK, so let's move on to another set of examples, uh, now more talking about threat models and what goes wrong there. So threat model problems. So these are sort of, OK, what kind of assumptions could you make that ends up be, you know, biting you and causing your system to be insecure? A fairly common one, important to appreciate, is assuming that your design or your implementation is secret. So lots of examples of this. One example was uh, in the 90s, I believe. The government came out with a proposal for a way to do encryption that would allow the government to spy on you, but no one else. And they had this chip called the Clipper chip that was a piece of silicon. You could only buy the chip. You couldn't look inside. And this chip was supposed to encrypt stuff in a way that should be good for you and me, but the government can always decrypt it later. So no problems there. Um, and the big assumption for them was that no one really knew what's inside of that chip and that the insides of the chip were actually secure. Um, turns out it's actually possible to open a chip and look at it with an electron microscope so you can reverse engineer in practice what's in there. And what was worse in this example of the Clipper chip from the 90s was that it um, turned out to be that the design was also 
not so great and had some holes in it, so that the whole thing was just broken, uh, if you look carefully. All right, so that seems like one example of some, someone cooking up a bad design for a system. Why would this be a bad idea in general? Maybe they got the, the, their thing right and uh, the world would have been great. Yeah? Open source, a lot of people can see, like, can like, look at your code and try to find problems and alert you of these problems. Oh, okay. so you're arguing that uh, making it open is probably a good idea because lots of people look at it. So I think, uh, you know, I, I, I'm with you. It like, seems like absolutely a good idea uh, to, to the extent that people look at it and help you. Seems great. Uh, but is it a good assumption? I, well, at some level, I think I agree with you that it's good to get people to look at your code. And open source seems like a great plan, or at least so far. Uh, but if you're trying to build some, you know, closed system, you don't actually care about people looking at your code, is this a good assumption? that people within your own organization will try to take advantage of the system that you've built. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is that one reason why this is a bad assumption is it has a huge sort of attack surface, if you will. Anyone in your company probably knows what the design is, and you're trusting them to keep it secret. Everyone that's ever worked at your company over time. So that might be a bad plan. Um, another, I think, angle on what you're saying is that if this assumption turns out to go wrong, and it's fairly easy to imagine how your design might leak at one point or time, you know, the scale of 10 years, like no way you're gonna keep a design secret. Then what? If that was the root of your security, and now your design's leaked out, how do you get your system to be secure again? Well, you gotta cook up a new secret design. That's crazy. <laughs> or you can't keep cooking up new secret designs every time the previous one leaks, and then you deploy it. So a much better plan is to really narrow what are the set of secrets that you're supposed to keep. So if your device is keeping maybe some secret key, that seems much easier. First of all, you can have maybe fewer people look at that key to begin with, or maybe it's just generated in the device and never given to any human at all. And then what's even more important is that if it turns out someone does get that key, you can just change the key. You don't need a whole new design and a design team to change, cook up a new design that no one can guess. So this ends up being sort of a bad security assumption, even on top of the fact that fewer people will look at the code and audit it. Make sense? All right. So that's one sort of threat model that's probably not a good thing to go with. Um, another turns out, uh, well, part of the threat model usually is uh, humans, so they have to be part of the system. And uh, they're not often so security-minded. Um, so if you have a system that assumes your, system, your users are all very careful, security-minded users that'll read every dialog box, you might be in for a surprise that users don't do this. They, uh, sort of as we were talking, users rarely care about security directly, and security mostly gets in the way of a regular user and says, no, you have to do something before you get your work done. And as a result, all these dialog boxes, or if, if you have users receiving dialog boxes or sort of questions, the user doesn't really read the question. The user sort of sees this and says, well, you know, do you want to get your work done, yes or no? Yes. Uh, so if you download some executable from the internet, you want to run it. It's kind of strange to ask the question, are you sure you really want to run this? Because the user just did that. The user meant to do it. Uh, maybe some other dialog box is called for or some other question, but to the extent that the user views your questions or interactions as questions about do you want to do this or not, Yes, the user is trying to do something. They'll say yes. Um, so it's important to keep uh, the users in mind and structure the system so that you're not assuming too much out of the user. So examples of failures here are you know, all these dialog boxes I mentioned that ask you whether you want to run something you just got from the web, or phishing attacks where users have to be super careful about which website do I open and what do I click on in my email attachment, et cetera. Um, Probably not a good overall system design that is expecting this much from the user and sort of have, having this in the threat model. Make sense? All right. Um, another example of a bad threat model is really assuming a very specific attack or specific attack vectors. So, my favorite example in this category um, has to do with these CAPTCHAs. Uh, so if you don't know what this means, you, you will surely have inter interacted with these. These are the various like, images that are funny shaped and you're supposed to be like, well, what is, what is this number? And you're supposed to type it in. 
And uh, the intent for these is to prevent various kinds of automated attacks. The assumption, as you could imagine, for these systems is that we're gonna, let's say, allow you to create an account at Gmail, but only if you can solve this little puzzle. Or we're only gonna allow you to send an email message if you can solve that puzzle. Or you can try to log in, but only if you can solve that puzzle. And the intent is not to prevent attacks because only the good guy can solve the puzzle. The intent is to rate limit the bad guys so that a regular human can solve one of these guys, no problem. But if an attack requires sending a million attempts to, let's say, guess the password of some victim user, the bad guy might have trouble solving a million of these little images. And many of the earlier sort of, you know, descriptions and you know, analyses of these captures assumed that, oh, this would be really hard to do uh, you know, some kind of a OCR algorithm for to recover the images, especially if they're multicolored and complicated and whatnot. And it turns out that's just like not how attackers attack this system. When faced with this problem, what the attackers did was they set up a website that outsourced solving these problems to people in Mongolia. And it turns out those guys get extremely well trained. They can solve these captures at a success rate far higher than an average user because they know how, to, how this thing looks like. Sometimes I can solve them, but if you're trained, you will be better. And it's super cheap. Turns out you can solve these things. You can like go to a website and enter a capture, and for some small fraction of a cent, you'll get a solution to your capture. Because there's sort of, you know, lots of workers somewhere solving these captures all day long. So not a good idea to assume a specific attack. Because indeed, if you had to cook up a careful computer algorithm to solve these things, you might have to hire a expensive engineer, and then every time the format changes, you'd have to hire a new engineer and cook up a new one, and it'll require some server. Turns out, there's much easier ways to attack it. So good to keep the sort of attacker's broad you know, set of possible attacks in mind to the extent that you can imagine what the attack might be. Make sense? Lots of examples of things like this uh, that you run into in practice. All right. Let's look at other interesting examples of these issues, of threat model problems. Um, here's an important one to keep in mind. Um, one uh, in the world of certificate authorities. So we'll talk much more in detail about this later in the class, but uh, in the case uh, on the web, uh, there exists an entity called the Certificate Authority whose job is to sign uh, certificates for different websites. So for example, Amazon.com has a certificate attesting to the fact that their servers are Amazon servers as opposed to someone else's. And the threat model sort of initially when designed was that, yeah, we'll have some number of CAs out there in the world and we'll trust all of them to do the right thing. So a browser, when you have it on your computer, will be willing to trust a certificate coming from any one of these authorities as certifying any website in the world. That seemed like a maybe okay design at one point when this was cooked up, probably 25 or more years ago at this point. Um, but what happened in practice was that these CAs proliferated. This was a, it turns out to be an important aspect of being able to run a secure website with HTTPS and lots of countries and lots of organizations set up these certificate authorities so that these days there's hundreds of these guys that your browser trusts. And the threat model went from trusting maybe a small handful of perhaps trustworthy authorities to now trusting 400 certificate authorities. So if that's your threat model, then the bad guy's job is to find the weakest one and compromise the weakest one. They don't have to worry about some certificate authorities that are doing a good job. They just need to find the least competent certificate authority. And it turned out that there's lots of examples of certificate authorities getting compromised because these are reasonably complicated things to run. They have to talk to lots of users. And there's lots of situations where certificate authorities were either broken into by attackers or had bugs that attackers could exploit or had other issues. And the end result was that a bad guy could convince a certificate authority to issue a certificate for some uh, name that wasn't their own. 
and that led to other issues. We'll, we'll talk much more about this CA issue uh, in later lectures where we talk about web security, but that's an example of maybe a threat model that might have seemed okay at a small scale, but when you scale it up to you know, 100x the size, not a good idea anymore. So these things, like many things in computer systems, you gotta revise it when the scale changes uh, by a large factor. Make sense? Other questions about this? All right, so maybe my last example in this category of uh, threat models has to do with uh, software development and distribution of software. So an amusing anecdote from software development was uh, in the 80s, the US Department of Defense started getting worried or was seriously worried about computer security and they ran a program of building what they called multi-level secure operating systems. So OSs that are really gonna keep the bad guys and the good guys apart on the same computer system because they were imagining big servers that everyone had an account on. So one of the, you know, that was a interesting program in many ways, but one of the surprising outcomes was uh, they hired a red team to try to attack various research prototypes of secure operating systems. And what the red teams often did, or at least in one case, uh, was, okay, the, their goal is to break into this computer system. They couldn't find any bugs in the computer system to break into, uh, but what they figured out was the guys didn't actually very good, do a very good job on the server that was storing the source code for the operating system. So, you know, source repo matters. So what happened was that the red team broke into the computer that was storing the source code for the supposedly secure operating system and added a backdoor to the source code of this OS. Then they waited for the researchers to recompile their OS and redeploy it, all this good stuff, and now their bug was just sitting there on the computer system that was supposed to be secure. Now they can go and very conveniently break in. So if you're worried about the full computer systems uh, security, you gotta worry about where are all the pieces coming from, like the source code. I guess these guys, these days, Git is the answer, but, well, sorry, Git is the source code repo you have. Doesn't give you the answer of how to keep it secure. Uh, but you gotta make sure your Git repos are containing the, sof the software that you actually want it to contain. Another interesting issue to worry about in this category is uh, software um, you know, development tools. So uh, like, where do you get your compiler from, like GCC? Uh, one example in this category where it went wrong was uh, Apple's development environment for their iOS for mobile phones. So in Apple's case, they have a giant you know, development tool called Xcode that you're supposed to use to develop apps for iPhones. This thing is gigantic, it's many gigabytes. It takes a while to download. Especially it takes a while to download in China where you have a big firewall and the internet connectivity is not so great. So many Chinese iPhone app developers got frustrated with having to download this Xcode big blob from Apple's servers. So he set up local mirrors in China of Xcode's tools. Someone compromised those mirrors. They couldn't comp compromise Apple's servers. Those were reasonably well secured. But the mirror was just some website on some guy's computer. They compromised that server and injected a backdoor into this Xcode tool. And then many iOS developers in China downloaded these backdoor tools. And then every iPhone app they built using those tools had a backdoor injected into that app. These uh, attackers were pretty clever. They modified the compiler so that they didn't break the compiler, but they made the compiler insert an extra feature into every iPhone app that was compiled using that Xcode tool. So not just the source code, but all the tools you're using as part of your workflow actually matter and have to be secure in order for the end result to have the security properties you care about. Make sense? Questions about these examples? All right, so maybe the last thing I'll mention in this category um, is on the software update side. Um, so even though some piece of software you're running now might be secure, doesn't mean it'll stay being secure. So a uh, surprising thing I was reading about a couple of years ago was uh, many malware developers would buy up Chrome and Firefox extensions that were popular. They would offer money to the developer of some nice extension, like some translator in Chrome or some shopping assistant in Firefox, whatever, 
these developers would be very excited. Someone actually wants to pay the money. They would sell the extension to this malware developer. And then the malware developer would release an update to this extension where the extension now didn't do what it was doing before or maybe did the same thing, but also did some extra stuff on the side like send all your passwords to the bad guy's server. So it's important to keep in mind who controls the keys used to distribute software updates. So even if you check the software, the extension now might be the next version is totally different. The same thing happened actually to uh, libraries in this JavaScript system called Node.js where it's not a browser extension, but there are some popular libraries. Uh, there was some event handling library in Node.js where the software developer of that reasonably popular library didn't want to deal with it anymore, got tired, and asked in the community, hey, you know, who wants to take over helping me maintain this guy, this extension, or this library? Someone stepped up, was doing a good job for a bit, and then they deployed malware in that library so that everyone that updated that library got uh, a version that scanned the computer for Bitcoin keys and sent them to the extension developer. So some, all these things, there, there's no great answer to this, but you gotta worry about them in your threat model to the extent that you wanna deal with these kinds of attacks or you think that the adversary you're up against might do something like tampering with your software or development tools or updates. Make sense? So, there's not, it's not super clear what to do about all this stuff, so like, what, what lessons can we draw? Probably one lesson is uh, making your threat model explicit might actually help you realize what your weaknesses are. So just listing out your assumptions might get you to think, well, I'm assuming that. That's not a very good assumption. Maybe I shouldn't assume it. So it's kind of helpful to list your threat model just as a forcing function to make sure you realize how bad or good things really are. Um, another sort of, of course, lesson from this is the less you assume is better. Um, so if you don't have to assume a specific attack vector, even better. If you don't have to assume this, great. So the smaller, the fewer assumptions you have, the better. And uh, a number of the techniques we're gonna look at in this class are techniques that transform your system where you don't have to assume something anymore. So encryption is a super powerful and of course general example where you don't have to assume that your link is secure if you can encrypt messages. It's just great. It eliminates all kinds of threats that you don't have to worry about it anymore. Someone intercepting wireless packets, who cares if it's encrypted? properly with various things. Uh, so th those are sort of the k powerful kinds of security ideas that will let you really improve your security by removing things from your threat model. In other words, removing things that the attacker could try to do and be successful. So better designs are probably the most positive uh, things you could do about a threat model is to uh, basically reduce the number of things in your threat model. Make sense? Questions about these examples? All right, so let's talk about the last category on that board. Uh, so we talked about uh, policy and threat model issues. Uh, mechanisms also have lots of things that go wrong with them. So let me uh, give you a couple of examples there. So mechanisms are basically bugs. So there could be bugs everywhere in your computer system and if there's a bug, the computer system might not be doing what you expect. So on the source code side, I'm sure you guys have lots of experience with bugs in software. Just as a good heuristic to keep in mind, much software has like super roughly one bug per thousand lines of code. And this number is not super accurate or important even, but the lesson to take away from this is the more code you have, the more bugs you have. And there is very little getting around that fact. You will have bugs, and the more software you have, the more bugs you'll have. So that's kind of unfortunate. And a particularly unfortunate thing is, as we'll see in a demo we'll do at the end of the class, uh, bugs actually matter even in non-security critical components. So even though you might have a bug in some seemingly unrelated and boring piece of code, might have significant security implications. And uh, there are some ways around it. We'll talk about it in the rest of this class. Uh, but uh, the thing to take away from is that unless you have some very clever and careful plans, 
all the software are bugs, all the software will have bugs, and all these bugs could lead to security problems. You should really think of it that way. Um, but sort of separate from software bugs, you might also have bugs in how your policy is implemented. So what I mean by this is that by these software bugs, I really mean I got some mistake in my piece of code that I wrote in Python or C or what have you. By this class of bugs, I'm imagining, well, you had a pretty good policy. You had some mechanism, but it's the wrong mechanism for your policy. You didn't implement your policy correctly with this mechanism. Uh, so there's bugs where you get that wrong as well, and uh, those are also reasonably damaging. So let me give you some examples, and then we'll try to do a demo at the end. Um, so here's a simple and relatively easy to understand example of misimplementing the policy. This isn't even a bug in your source code that I want to give you an example of, but really an example of you had a good policy and you failed to implement it. Um, so this actually showed up in Apple's iCloud system. So at a level of some very high level picture, iCloud is this very uh, well, large cloud service that Apple offers for users of its devices. And there's very many things you could do to this uh, system if you view it as a whole. There's many APIs that try to let you log in from your laptop, from your desktop, from your smartwatch, from various applications that you might be using with iCloud, all this stuff, super complicated. And at least for the purpose of this example, I want to look at a specific policy they had. So their policy, or sort of the plan, was um, rate limit um, login attempts. And the reason this was part of their policy is because they didn't want to assume super careful users, so they assumed that their users might choose weak passwords. If you have a not so great password, an attacker could try to guess it, and they'll probably be successful after, you know, a thousand or a million guesses, something like this, depending on how good your password is, the bad guy will probably try to guess it. One of the sort of few things that really defend against that is rate limits. So if the bad guy can only try to log into your account once an hour or something, or once a minute, that really reduces how many attempts they could make. Now we could quibble about the rates, et cetera, but it's important to rate limit. If you don't rate limit, computers are super fast. You might issue a million requests per second, and this is a service with lots of servers. It's scalable. It can probably handle a million attempts per second to log in. So what happened was that they implemented rate limits. They had a rate limit here, they had a rate limit here, and then they forgot. Uh, so if you have a large system, sometimes you might actually forget to implement some checks from your policy. What happened is that one of their APIs, this happened to be the API for finding your lost iPhone. So if you forgot your iPhone, you can go to some web page on iCloud and say, help me find it, buzz the phone, and okay, well, I gotta log in, supply my password. In that one API, they forgot the rate limit check. So great policy, if you don't implement it fully, doesn't actually help, and bad guys were able to abuse this thing even though they had no intention of finding anyone's iPhone, this helped them guess passwords of iCloud users. Make sense? So one sort of lesson to take away from this is that if you have anywhere in your design that requires many checks, uh, well, that's really error prone, and probably some of them will be missing. So a design that requires your users or operators or developers to write lots of checks will probably mean that some of them are missing, and, uh, well, depends on what check it is, we'll determine how bad it is. Make sense? Questions? All right. Here's another sort of interesting example of an implementation problem, maybe a little bit closer to just pure software bugs, uh, but uh, randomness for crypto. So cryptography, widely used for all kinds of things, encryption, Bitcoin, keys, et cetera, uh, requires all kinds of randomness. So what I mean by randomness is that in cryptography, you sometimes want to generate random bits that are going to serve as your private key or some kind of a random value that the bad guy doesn't know. And it's crucial that the bad guy can't guess this thing. Otherwise, they'll know your key and decrypt everything and impersonate you. The way this is typically implemented in pretty much every computer system is that you have something called a pseudo-random number generator. 
or PRNG. What this box looks like is that on one end, it gives you as many random bits as you want. Whenever you want some random bits, you ask it, and then you just use them. But in order for them to be random, it's got an input called a seed. So you have to initialize the pseudo-random number generator once, or maybe over time, maybe you give it more seeds as time goes on, to randomize its behavior. If the bad guy knows the seed, he can run the same thing, get the same random bits out. That's not so random anymore. So it better be the case that you got some nice seed in here to generate these random bits. And you probably don't want to use the seed directly because who knows, maybe some parts of your seed are actually not random. So this is kind of a nice mixing function you can think of. You got a bunch of seed bits. Some of them might be random, some of them not so good. You just shove them all in and out comes a good stream of all kinds of random bits. Good abstraction, turns out people misuse it in their overall system. Uh, so one example is uh, Android applications for Bitcoin transactions. Uh, many of them used a standard API in Java, which is used on Android, to generate various cryptographic random bits for issuing Bitcoin transactions or generating keys. And some of those applications forgot to initialize the seed. Easy mistake. But the interesting thing is the whole thing worked, right? If you don't initialize the seed, you get some numbers out. It all seems to work. You get Bitcoin transactions. Everything is great. But then someone realized, some attacker realized this fact and was able to <laughs> regenerate the same random bits, regenerate the same keys that your victims had. And now you can know the Bitcoin key of your victim, and then you can transfer their Bitcoins to wherever you want. And uh, slightly more sophisticated versions of similar attacks also worked. So just forgetting one call also turns out to be a bad plan. You can sort of see common themes here, right? Like we were talking about bad defaults. Well, that's an example of a bad default. By default, it just works, except it's not random. <laughs> so that seems like a bad default for what's supposed to be generating random numbers for you. Um, another example of this that's a little bit trickier is um, in embedded devices or virtual machines. Uh, they also need random bits for all kinds of crypto. But uh, in an embedded device, okay, what I mean by embedded device is like, you know, one of these little, I don't know, thermostat or some kind of a dongle you buy, you plug it in, boots up, it's just going to generate some random keys and then do stuff, I don't know, measure temperature. That device is super deterministic. If you're going to manufacture a million copies of the same thing, a million users around the world are going to plug in this device, it's going to do the exact same thing across those million users because it has no other input. It just boots up, generates some keys, and moves on. So in embedded devices, you don't actually have good seeds. So what happened was that on these devices, the manufacturer installed Linux. Linux faithfully tried to collect seeds or sort of randomness in input from various interrupts and temperature sensors and what have you, what's available in the device, and shoved this into this PRNG. But because the devices are so identical between users, they got the same seed every single time. It's like a very nice, you know, compact device. Did the same thing repeatedly. And now, even though all your software seems good, the fact that you have a million copies in everyone's hand means it's all identical. Similar examples sort of work out uh, as well. In virtual machines, for example, if you boot up a virtual machine on a cloud service, uh, if the virtual abstraction is pretty good, it'll boot up the same way every single time. And similarly, generate the same keys every single time. So you've got to get it, go out of your way a little bit to get the right randomness in a virtual machine as well. Make sense? Yeah, question. So you said like warning in virtual machines before where you're not supposed to use like early randomness. I thought that was like a hard, like is that actually just because they're that repeatable if they get the same randomness? So oh, indeed, I think uh, many of them are really repeatable. So what actually happens in the Linux kernel is it needs to get the seed from somewhere. So typically what happens is uh, the timing of various interrupts goes into the seed. The keyboard input might go into the seed, or at least the timing of keystrokes might go into the seed. The timing of network packets might go into the seed. But all the stuff is basically gone in a virtual machine. All the interrupts happen instantaneously because it's all virtualized. All the network packets arrive right away, and uh, you have no keystrokes. You have no real devices. It's all simulated to happen right away. So you get the same stream of seeds Maybe it's not exactly the same, but you can enumerate all the different possibilities for what happens in a virtual machine much better than you might have a chance of in a real hardware machine. Um, so I think that's the source of these issues. Uh, it really is much more repeatable. What happens, of course, is that you know, people realize this over time, and then they fix it in several ways. One is that sometimes the virtual machine monitor, like the host, will inject some randomness into your VM up front and say, oh, yeah, well, if you want some randomness, here's some nice seeds. Uh, another thing is the hardware, 
that runs underneath this whole thing, underneath the virtual machine and the host, provides hardware instructions for getting randomness. So to the extent that you trust, let's say, Intel or AMD to have a good random generator in hardware, you can just invoke this instruction and get randomness in your virtual machine that way, bypassing whatever Amazon's thinking. Uh, so possible to do the right thing, but again, you have to realize this problem, and then many of these solutions are sometimes straightforward. Make sense? Questions? All right. So the last example I want to give you, guys, is uh, an example of uh, implementation bugs that are pretty low level, but extremely popular, uh, called a class of uh, bugs called buffer overflows. Uh, so this is a topic that you'll hear about lots and lots. Probably you've already heard of it in all kinds of security contexts. This is going to be actually the topic of lab one. So you'll learn a lot about it in uh, lab one. The first part is due this Friday, by the way. Um, so um, we'll look at the detail of what this buffer overflow does, but sort of the context you could imagine is that you got some server, like a web server here, and uh, it's going to be accepting HTTP requests from the world. So you send it some kind of an HTTP request here. And uh, sometimes the server crashes. How bad is this? Well, from a security perspective, you should really think of this as, man, I just like, didn't understand what my server is doing. You've got to really understand every case, because it's negative goal. If it's working correctly, then maybe you understand what every HTTP request does. But here, clearly, some HTTP requests are doing something you didn't realize. That's bad for our negative goal plan. And in this particular case, it turns out that, we'll look at some example. Some of these crashes could be translated into the adversary running arbitrary code on your web server and doing fairly sort of unbounded damage. So let's look at this piece of code um, on the screen up there. So here's a little example code program that I wrote. Um, so these are sort of the interesting bits at the bottom. That's a very sort of approximation simplification of a web server. It's got a main function that supposedly reads a request and then the request is an integer, and then it prints that integer. And the code for reading the request that you see up there reads the string into a buffer, this is C code, then converts the string into an integer and returns it. Fairly straightforward, hopefully. Um, so let me just pull it up on the side of the screen here so that you can um, reference it as we do something with it. Uh, but uh, here's how it works. I can compile it. I can run this thing, give it some number. Seems to work. So here's what's going to be surprising, if I give it lots of input, lots of A's, lots of A's. Well, it's not a number, but what's worse, well, you know, that works. Let's give it more A's. Um, what if I give it even more A's? Well, now, now that's worse, right? Like, at least the A's were a zero, maybe that's okay, but the fact that it's crashing, getting a segmentation fault, that's a little bit worrying. And you should really think of this as, well, from an attacker's perspective, Let's investigate and figure out how we can use this. What exactly is going on, and could we use it in some surprising way? So what we're going to try to do here is try to understand why is the application crashing, and how do we control this crash in ways that maybe the attacker could take advantage of? So the way we're going to do this is by using a debugger to pull up this program and uh, sort of step through what happens if I type in all those A's and uh, the crash happens. So let's first uh, set a breakpoint for this function redirect you see on the left side, and then run this code. And I got hit this breakpoint. I am now in the debugger, right at this point on the left where I'm just starting redirect. So let's try to understand what this code is doing. So uh, one way to look at it is to sort of disassemble the resulting assembly. The details are going to be at the super low machine level here. So we are inside of this function. This is actually the compilation of the redirect source code on the left. And we are right at this point. So what the compiled code is doing is doing some manipulations with these RSP and RBP registers. These are the stack pointers in a program. So let me draw that diagram for you so that we can keep track of what's happening on the stack in this program. And that'll turn out to be important for understanding why the crash happens and how we can control it. So here's uh, a diagram of the stack. In this particular case, we're running on an x86 computer, my laptop. That has a stack that grows down. So the stack has stuff pushed onto it. So when you call a function, stuff gets pushed onto the stack. The caller is up here. The thing you called is down here. 
So here we'll have our redirect somewhere, and then up here we'll have the main function that called redirect. So let's try to understand what's happening in the stack. So the way we're going to do this is we can uh, look at our registers. So this command tells us that um, here's a stack pointer. DC20 is our stack pointer. And x86 has this helpful register called RBP, which is basically your caller's stack pointer. So we have these two stack pointers. DC20 is down here. This is RSP, DC20. This points down here at the bottom of the stack. And then RBP is up here. This points to the stack of our caller, main. Let's try to understand what's in those boxes now. So somewhere on the left side of the screen, you see that we have a buffer and a value i. So let's try to figure out where those guys live. We can actually print them out in the debugger. So buff at 0 lives at actually the bottom of the stack, dc20. So you can see that actually buff is located right at the bottom. So this is where the first location of buff is. Buff of 0 is down here. And then we have all the other buff elements until we get the end of the buffer. Buff of 127. All right. And then up here, we'll see is basically where the variable i is. We can print it as well. And uh, you can see that's sort of dcac. That's a little bit higher up in the stack. Bigger addresses are up in that diagram. And then RBP is just past i. RBP is this value up here, dcb0. That's right after i. So this diagram is sort of making sense. But what's up there? What's sort of up above our variables? So if we look at the diagram uh, further, what actually turns out to be the case is that on x86, your parent caller stack frame contains their saved RBP register. So that's basically a pointer to their parent stack frame. And here is an important thing that we'll look at, which is the return address. This is where we should return when we're done executing the redirect function. So let's try to actually, OK, so let's look at the code again. This sort of maybe makes sense, some sense. So the first instruction we already ran was subtracting 90 from our stack pointer. That's how we grew the stack frame for redirect. The stack pointer used to be where RBP is in that diagram on the board. And then the subtract fun instruction moved it down to allocate space for I in the buffer. So that's what's going on. And now we can try to actually uh, look at what's higher up in the stack. We can look at RBP. This is the pointer to the saved RBP. So that's the caller of main. And if we go eight above, we see this value, which is the return address in that diagram on the board. We can actually try to disassemble this return address, CF3. And that is right here. This is in main right after the call to redirect. That's all sort of hopefully making some sense. What you're seeing is the assembly for the main function. And right after it calls redirect is the highlighted line. That's the return address you're seeing on the stack. That's where this guy is going to return when it's done. All right. So hopefully this makes some sense. Let's actually run this and get it to crash. So now it's running. Now I've run into this get us function on the left. I'll type in some A's. Uh, let's see. I'll paste them to go quicker. All right, it should be enough. OK, so entered some A's. Now we're at that next line of here, A to I. Let's see what actually happens. What did we do? Let's look at our buffer, buff of 0. All right, so we have 190 A's. This might be a little bit worrying because our buffer was only 128 large. So what, me what this means is that we have a lot of A's here, but also we have A's up here <laughs> where they maybe shouldn't be. <laughs> So all these A's sort of went all the way up the stack into all kinds of locations here that weren't actually meant to be the buffer. But because this is sort of low-level C code, this is what the code does. And now, if we uh, sort of, well, the next thing is I want to step over the uh, call to A to I. You know, it'll convert to something, probably 0, because it's not a number. But now, let's see where we are in the code. Now we're sort of about to return from this redirect function because we did A to I. Now we got this return i. And if we step up to it closer, now we're at the very last instruction of redirect. This is the ret instruction. And the setup where we are is we're just about to pop this return address off the stack 
and try to go back to main. Except that this doesn't have the return address of main anymore. If we look at it again, if we sort of try to figure out where we are, well, it used to be that that nice return address of main was in here. Now it's OX4141441. What is this hex value? Well, it's the hex value of A in ASCII. So the return address has been written over by all these A's. So if I try to now step one more instruction and return to main, what will happen is that now I get my seg fault because now I'm trying to write, run code at the address of all A's. It's not allocation that has any sensible code, at least in this program. So in this case, it's crashing. Nothing bad is happening. But the thing is, the attacker is not limited to writing A's there. They could write all kinds of addresses there, and they get to fully choose, in this example, exactly where they jump. They might jump into some code that'll do whatever they want. And this is what lab one is gonna be about. And you could actually imagine even sort of setting it to something concrete. So we can actually even recover from this. Uh, we can jump back to main to just before the printf. So we could do something like this where we actually, instead of all the A's, let's overwrite that stack with a return address of our choosing. I'm just gonna choose back to main just for fun, but now we can uh, tell it to resume and, ah, it actually ran and printed x equals 10 because it jumped to our choice of code pointer, which is back in main, to that printf statement, and it printed x equals 10. The 10 is some contents of some register. You'll carefully arrange it in your labs. Uh, and then it crashed because the stack was kind of corrupted anyway. But it did run code that we chose on the stack. So this is why this kind of vulnerability allows an attacker quite a wide range of possibilities. They can inject code into that stack, choose where they jump, and execute arbitrary code. So this seemed like a bug that was in not security relevant code at all, just parsing the input message. But that bug allows a bad guy to do anything they want. So if this server was running on some machine with administrative privileges like root, well, now you'd be able to, as an attacker, run any code you want as root on that server. That's pretty damaging. So this used to be like the number one bug that everyone would use to exploit software. I think now web-based bugs in JavaScript are probably more popular, so web is one in some sense, but this is still a big source of real bugs in real systems. And you guys will learn all about it in lab one. All right, so that's it for this lecture. Read a paper and uh, see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>